Okay, so thanks everyone for joining uh, this post-London infrastructure call. Um, yeah, so I guess the goal here is mostly just to discuss kind of, you know, what different people have seen uh, since London has gone live, um, how, you know, we can adjust. I know that, like, I, there's been a lot of conversations uh, happening around, like, you know, how do we handle the new, the new fee mechanism and, and uh, yeah, how do, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, we're providing, like, a good user experience to people. Um, so, um, uh, I guess, yeah, uh, the first thing on the agenda was like an overview of the upgrade. I mean, to just do this quickly, at least on the consensus level side, everything worked kind of as expected. So, you know, we don't expect to do any changes to kind of the core protocol shortly regarding the, the fee market. Um, we didn't see anything kind of go wrong or go different than what we would have expected uh, from the test nets and from the, the just the simulations that we've done in the past. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I'm curious to hear just like from others on this call what they've seen and uh, it can be useful if, you know, if, if you share something to just kind of share what, what product or at the very least what type of product you're working on. I think, you know, wallets have had a lot of uh, interesting experiences, but yeah, just curious to hear kind of from everybody what what they've seen and, and, and if there's any issues that they think are, are important to that we, sh we, should, we should bring up. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, my name is Austin Bunsen. I'm the co-founder of QuickNode. We provide blockchain infrastructure to companies. Uh, we're running Open Ethereum. Uh, and this is probably very, very unrelated to uh, uh, the London hard fork, but maybe just in case I'm going to mention it, we are noticing that um, we're seeing a lot of dropped peers after upgrading to the uh, version of Open Ethereum that supports London. Again, probably unrelated, but just throwing it out there in case it is pertinent. Okay, thanks. That's good to know. I'm not sure what's this. So I know Open Ethereum was being deprecated after basically after London. Um, I assume like they still have people looking at the, the repo uh, help. Um, yeah, so uh, is, there, is there a specific issue actually that you've opened or anything yet or that you've seen on the repo? No, yeah, we've been toying okay. with configs and trying to figure it out. Okay, um, yeah, if, if, if you do not figure it out, I think, yeah, if, if you can share just the issue like in the all core devs chat, uh, once you have that, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I know a lot of the, basically a lot of the open Ethereum team has migrated to Aragon. So the devs are still kind of working in the ecosystem and that's probably something they, they should look at if, uh, if it needs to be fixed. Awesome, thank you. Um, if no one has like anything burning, uh, I saw Barnabé, uh, you were on the agenda as having some data to present about the upgrade so far. Is that right? Yes. I've got uh, a couple of slides. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and share that? Sure. Let me share the screen. Can you see it? Yes. Yep. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, disclaimer, it's been only a week, so it's really early impressions. And I did not get as much time also as I wanted to, to dig into much more data. But uh, yeah, I hope these impressions kind of maybe help frame uh, some of the discussions after. So as a kind of look back to a previous conversation we've had on the podcast. I said I would be looking at three things, the gas used, kind of the dynamics to see when are we in full blocks and maybe first price auctions kind of come back on the table. Um, the second thing is base fee. What does the, let's say, trace of the base fee look like? Is it, is it smooth? Is it more like oscillatory? And then the last part is the oracles and are they doing the job well enough? Like are they tuned properly? 
So I'll try to say a couple of things on each point. Uh, on the gas used, I focused here on the longest streak that I found as of yesterday. I, I don't know if another NFT drop happened in the meantime, but the longest streak, streak of full-ish blocks I found was around 35 blocks. Uh, so it took the base fee from yeah low 30s to something like over 1,500 GUI. Um, and I'm plotting below here the priority fees of 1559 transactions that were included uh, during that ramp up. Namely, I'm plotting the interquantile range, so like the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile of priority fees. I guess if we expected to see like these first price auctions on the priority fee, we would expect some kind of ramp up that would be a bit smoother uh, than it is. Like here, the priority fees really get super high very quickly. And my impression is that uh, what happened is legacy transactions are still very much dominating on the network. And at this point, they, they were at the time. Um, so these transactions are sent with a high gas price uh, because we cast them into these 1559 formats with like full priority fees. Um, their priority fees are high. And so in turn, the 1559 transactions, they kind of copy uh, via the Oracle and they also send high priority fees. I see that Mika has the hand raised. Should I, yeah, do you want to go ahead? Uh, just wondering, so you have a couple of dips on the top graph there. Um, are those artifacts or was there actually block space available? Yeah, at some point there were like a, a less than full block. So I, I kind of took the streak to be, uh, yeah, if you, if you don't take, I, can, I can't really take 100% because there's always a little bit of space. So I, I took it as like a, the moving average was above something like 95%. So there was indeed like maybe one block where the gas use was a bit lower than others. Yes. Okay, so it wasn't like a an empty block or something that could have been an artifact of just how mining works? Like it was partially full, meaning the miner was including Correct. transactions and everything? Correct, yeah. Definitely not empty because this, this is like the proper uh, size, so something like 21 million gas, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I've published this dashboard on the Dune Analytics, so if you want to take a closer look, I can send the links after. Right. Yeah, so maybe we do have FPAs, but at the moment, I guess it's a bit early to, to conclude that, uh, okay, this is what the system will look like when you have a series of full blocks. I think a lot of what we're seeing might be artifacts of having more legacy transactions in the system. Uh, about base fees, so people have noticed that it seems to oscillate quite a bit, like it's not really smooth. It goes up, down, up, down. Sometimes you have a full block then followed by another empty block. Is that normal? So we know that there's definitely like a let's say a region of the system where things can happen that make base fee look like this. Uh, my take on this at the moment, and this is more of a reasoned intuition than actual uh, data analysis, is that legacy transactions that are sent by users, they would set the gas price to something that's maybe higher than base fee, but which remains kind of close to base fee because the oracles they use they gave they give them kind of okay this is the ambient uh, current gas price and so this is what you should set your parameter to so you send a transaction which is close to base fee which means that um, includable transactions they actually tend to clump around the current base fee small upward deviations of base fee then price out a lot of transactions and if you have then base fee decreasing a little you have suddenly like a lot of transactions which are again includable so you could observe like these sorts of hiccups uh, due to the fact that these legacy transactions they they are not they don't have like a lot of margin uh, to get into the system or not as much margin as the 1559 transactions have uh, with the max fee another point is comparing legacy and 1559 transactions so this was a simulation that we've done maybe a year ago. 
uh, trying to simulate a mixed system where you have both legacy users and uh, 1559 users, exactly the same, uh, let's say, dynamics. But what we observed is actually, it's not really that legacy users overpay, uh, especially when they send their transaction with a gas price, which is kind of close to the base fee, but it's more that they are easily non-includable. And in that case, so these uh, red, purple, and brown line, they all represent uh, legacy users, while the green, I think green and yellow line, well, the line, the flat line here is 1559 users. So what happens is anytime base fee kind of rises, suddenly uh, legacy users, they get priced out and they have to wait quite a bit. So so I see, I see kind of two scenarios, either they're included quickly if the base fee is stable, uh, these legacy users, or they're priced out and they need to wait until the, the base fee comes back down. So my take on this is that they seem to be paying more with their time uh, than with their money. And actually, um, thanks Block Native. I've, I've seen this graph. Uh, Perama gave me a heads up that this exists. It was posted in the GAF Discord. And it does seem like uh, so these blue spikes uh, is kind of a pending time to inclusion for legacy transactions. And it does seem to be considerably longer than most of the 1559 transactions. So I think these dynamics are quite interesting, especially still um, as we have quite a bit of legacy transaction in the system. All right, so last point, the oracles. This is more of an anecdotal observation, but I was able to send transaction with one way priority fee and they got in really, really quickly even though MetaMask was at the time recommending me to use like minimally four to five GUI. Uh, and this is not to put down MetaMask. I think it was quite smooth experience. Um, but as Tim noticed also in the notes for this call, I'm guessing that the priority fee Oracle might be biased a bit upward. And most likely this is due again to the legacy transactions who when they got in, uh, they might be, even if I said, they, they pay more with their time than with their money. There's still more range for them to, to overpay on the priority fee. And so perhaps this is biasing the, the fee history oracle a little. I think if we want to be sure of that, we could kind of take a look at the inclusion delay as a function of the priority fee that was sent. Um, yeah, that would give us maybe a clearer picture of, of what's happening. But it'd be interesting to know how low can we go with the priority fee and what are the kinds of uh, guarantees that we need uh, on this fee to be to be included. This, whoop, yeah, go ahead, Mika. Uh, do we know what formula MetaMask is using to determine that four to five base fee or four to five priority fee? Ella, no. Oh, my, my understanding was that they were using the fee history oracle, but perhaps they are on the call. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know for sure, but I think the four to five is some sort of minimum um, depending on the, the setting. So I think in the, if I if I remember correctly, it was the last call where I think we had discussed sort of like starting minimums um, and four to five was in the range. I think like two, three and four or something. So if uh, it pulls from the fee history, but if it's, if it's like one way or something, we might be hitting a minimum, but I'm not positive. That's just my guess. I don't think it's a minimum. I, I used it earlier today and it was recommending to me like 4.73296 or something. Like it, it didn't seem like a hard coded number unless someone had fun with primes. And it's possible we may have updated at this point too. I'm not sure when this data was pulled from. Yeah, so there might be a minimum, but I still believe there is some kind of dynamics here where the priority fee, so fee history is looking at the quantiles. Uh, the quantize might be quite high because a lot of people are a, a little overpaying with their priority fee. So that, that could also be yeah, both a combination of having a hard-coded minimum plus the Oracle itself. Yeah, and if you had a lot of legacy transactions, right, like these might push, you know, you, you could have a case where, say, only 5% of the block is 1559 transactions. Those transactions can get in with a one-way priority fee. But then if you're looking at, say, the first you know, 
this aisle, there's not even 10% of the block that's 1559 transactions. So you're pulling the priority fee from a legacy transaction. And that might explain why it's, it's, uh, it's lower. I thought the fee history endpoint was giving you a percentile of the lowest priority fee included in the last okay. uh, N blocks. Is that not correct? Uh, in that case, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm not super confident on that statement. So if someone knows better, please speak up. <laughs> and yeah, I'm not sure as well. But it seems, yeah, it would be interesting to dig into this. Uh, right, so this was for the priority fee. So the second parameter that is kind of relying on Oracle a bit more crudely at the moment is the max fee. So the early guideline that we we set was to say, okay, look at the current base fee, multiply it by two, add whatever you were going to propose as priority fee, and this should be good enough. And if we have more data, we will make it better. Um, and this is some data courtesy of Perama. Thank you for the data, um, which, which seems to be saying that, so, okay, what is happening here? The, what he's been looking at is uh, how long does the transaction stay viable given that you are multiplying, you're setting the max fee as a multiple of the current base fee. And 2x definitely remains viable for 30 seconds because there's no way the base fee can go that high. 99% plus of the time, it remains viable for a, a couple of minutes even. But it seems the numbers are fairly close uh, even for lower multipliers. So 1.7, 1.5, even 1.3. So in a sense, what this seems to say is maybe the market isn't so uh, unstable that we need to have two X. Maybe we can use uh, less aggressive uh, max fees than 2x, a default of 1.5 seems fairly reasonable. This is, of course, um, maybe more of a static analysis of if everybody changes their max fee to something else, the dynamics could be different. But uh, I, I do think this is early evidence that, yeah, 2x might be a little high. Go ahead, Mickey. Um, what was sorry, I might have missed it. What was the time frame this data was gathered over? Was it since launch till now? Yes, I think he posted that two days ago. So pretty much most of the blocks until that time. Yeah. And does that does that include that big event you mentioned earlier where we had a bunch of blocks in a row? Oh, I, I think so. Yes. I would check, but uh, okay. I believe it, it does. Yeah. Yeah, even if that spike is not included, I, well, these spikes are not so long, right? So you could still have a spike for, it could represent 0.01% of your sample and, and you would still be viable. Right. So, yeah. Uh, all right, that's about it. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to highlight is that I thought was really, really interesting and super cool was the many uh, Dune dashboards, there was definitely like a lot of community engagement around looking at the data. Uh, I actually learned a lot from conversations on if r and a lot of inputs from wallets, implementers, infrastructure providers. Um, that was super nice. Hopefully this continues. I think we're all like really keen to, to dig more into this. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, this was great. Um, I guess uh, the other just kind of thing uh, I wanted to make sure we mentioned on the call is uh, we talked about the fee history API. Uh, I know there was some issue where like uh, the return type for the oldest block before was uh, in decimal rather than hex and that caused some problems. So guest released version 1.10.7 yesterday, where the return type uh, of the oldest block in fee history is now a hex string. Um, so I think, yeah, a few people had mentioned that this was causing issues and, and, and that should be fixed if you if you use the latest release by guest. Um, and I guess that's pretty much, you know, what we had 
plan for the agenda, like I'm, I'm happy to leave the rest of the call for just people's concerns or comments or anything, you know, y'all want to discuss. Um, if I jump in here, the only thing that I've noticed is that very low priority fees are getting included. So for example, 0 0.3 GUI, uh, GUI. Um, and I'm just wondering if anybody had any thoughts around why that is happening or how that might change. Um, because previously, uh, we'd spoke about the minimum being, for example, one or two, or as Jake said before, possibly three, four, uh, Gway. So yeah, and any ideas around why that is happening? That's really interesting. How how frequently have you seen like 0.3? Like not zero, right? Like zero would happen like if you send a transaction directly to a miner, but like, yeah, I haven't seen a ton of uh, between zero and one. Yeah, so oh, yeah. people from uh, our side have been testing. I, I don't know if Roman. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here. Wants to yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I sent like, I don't know, probably 10, 15 transactions with uh, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 GUI. And also sometimes uh, I set uh, max priority uh, fee higher. And, uh, but transactions would be still included with uh, like uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 tip. <clears throat> uh, well, because base fee would be uh, kind of higher than I expected, but those yeah. uh, transactions still would be included. Yeah. And do you, do you have like a rough sense for how long they would sit in the, in the transaction pool? Well, I, I had, uh, uh, so sometimes it uh, took like hours, but uh, okay. um, I had like multiple times when it was like four or 10 minutes. That's really cool. Like, I mean, the, I guess the reason, you know, we mentioned one or two as an initial base fee is because that's the price that like offsets the uncle risk for miners. Um, and it's kind of like the, economically fair price if you want um whereas where if they include transactions on average for one way and then they get on cold you know every so often then they should end up end up net ahead um so i'd be like i wouldn't want to like see like defaults go below one way just because um i think then we end up in a spot where like, if, if, if we're sending transactions, which are on average, not profitable for miners to include, um, that, that might not be great, but I, I, yeah, I guess, you know, some miners might be willing to pick up those transactions, you know, if there's nothing else in the transaction pool. And, um, yeah, I, I, I guess what, what we're seeing is kind of like the equivalent of like before, if the gas price was 20 and you sent like a transaction with one way or something, and like some miner just decided to pick it up. Um, yeah. So, so basically the, so, the simplest way for me to reproduce this was to set uh, like ma max uh, fee per gas as uh, like base fee, which is like 10th percentile for past uh, 100 blocks, 10th percentile of base fee. Uh, plus uh, the value which is returned by uh, max uh, max hyper gas method, and uh, in this case, uh, usually transactions would be included like in ten minutes or so, and uh, <clears throat> tip would be reduced to some value below one gray. Yeah. So, if anyone is interested in, uh, uh, are, are you saying? Are you saying the, the effective uh, premium was below one or the uh, premium you set on the transaction was below one? What, what I said oh, I is usually higher than uh, one way. Okay, so th that suggests there might actually be a bug in guess then since then I would not be surprised if one of them screwed it up. Uh, my guess is, is they're not, um, they're sorting transactions by the, uh, 
premium on the transaction, not the effective premium. And they're not correctly excluding when that doesn't get met. I would be curious if someone can get through a transaction separately. So, so this should be looked into, see if it's a bug in geth. If not, it's probably some miner running a custom fork where they screwed something up. Um, either way, I would be curious if someone can get through a transaction with less than one as the uh, configured premium on the transaction. Uh, that would indicate a different situation. Oh, yes. I can that, try that something happened, right now. That happened also. I, I used uh, like uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 set as max fee per gas. Uh, and it, it worked. Yeah. Max, max fee priority. per gas or max, fee pre max premium per gas? Oh, max max right, priority. priority. Max T. Okay. So, yeah, I, so I find those transactions if, if you need so. not a big deal. So in the case of when you set that, so we, I think there's probably two situations here. One, either a bug in geth or a bug in miners um, with regards to internal transaction sorting and causing them to not correctly do the rational thing. Um, the other one for when the priority fee on the transaction is actually set to lower than one, um, we saw this a long time ago, um, back before there was congestion in Ethereum when you could just throw a transaction out and it would get included eventually because there's always space. Um, there were some miners that mined and transactions that were below like what was profitable for them, like despite everyone knowing that it was unprofitable. We, we always assumed they were just like altruistic miners who just, you know, didn't really care about the money, just wanted to make Ethereum great and include everybody who wanted to get included. And so you could like do like a 0.5 or 0.1 even um, transaction and just wait several hours until this one random altruistic miner would show up and include your transaction. Um, I, it might be something similar, um, or it could just be one of the miners configured something wrong or they're testing things. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's a good comment in the chat like, different miners have also different profitability threshold um and uh yeah I mean, maybe i don't think i don't think any miner that we know of has uh uncle risk that's lower than significantly lower yeah. than one like 0.8 i think vitalik ran the numbers well back and 0.8 was like for the for the good miners the ones that were really well connected and had very low uncle rates like 0.8 was their threshold Um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely share this with the Get team and make sure that they look into it. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing the two transactions there. Um, yeah. Um, was there? Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to bring up something else and just thinking out loud here. Uh, based on some conversations with uh, users of Etherscan, like uh, it feels like there's uh, like two different uh, groups of users when it comes to gas prices. Like there are the people who want to get their transaction through uh, in a short or reasonable amount of time for them. And that's the ones who want to have like the current or previous kind of gas oracle experience. And then kind of the comments that I've seen in the agenda and uh, even for myself, like there is a, another kind of user who would be okay with spending like one or two priority max fee, and then with a max fee of like a few a few way higher than the current base fee, and it gives them like a say a ninety plus percent uh, probability of getting their transaction through within the next couple of minutes. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if others have a similar kind of um, uh, perception that there's like a, like two different uh, groups, and it kind of like whatever guest oracle that you want to show. Um, it, you know, you kind of have to choose which group you're you're showing for. I'd say I've I've heard people also mention there's like a third group, which I think is is maybe the group that's having the toughest time is people who want to send a transaction with a low fee, who don't mind it, it waiting like for hours in the transaction pool. Um, so it's like you want the per there's like the person who wants to be in the next block, the person who wants to be in the next five blocks. And the person who wants to be in the next like 24 hours. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, cur I, I'm curious if like wall, wall teams or others. Yeah. So the, the, the core problem here is that when you try to 
each every user has different time preference. And so some users have a high time preference, some users have low time preference. And when you try to factor that in, you end up with a far more complicated problem. And the UX becomes insane very rapidly. Um, basically, it turns it from a like being able to ask user a question, yes or no, versus asking a user to look at a 3D chart and say, where are you on this three-dimensional graph? Like in this three-dimensional curve, where are you? You know, in terms of both time preference and financial preference. And you know, these are multiple variables in this problem. And so the, the reason I have always lobbied for the defaults for, for wallets to be um, what, what I have, which is you know, low priority fee, high max fee, is because it simplifies the problem to just a Boolean question. So just a yes or no for users, which is very easy. And it just to kind of assumes that everybody has a time preference of I want in right now or not at all. Um, and the only reason, not because we think that is the dominant user, but because that is the easiest user to solve a problem for. And it gives a, a very comfortable user experience even when they fail. So like even it gracefully degrades to, okay, I'll just come back later. Which, you know, for, you can express that to users by just saying, hey, by the way, you know, transaction fees change throughout the day. You might want to try again. It's something easy to communicate to users where it's very difficult to communicate to users hey, here's a three-dimensional curve of uh, all the possible things you need to consider if you want to include your transaction. Um, and so, yeah, so, so you're definitely right. There are definitely users across the spectrum that have you know, different time preferences, different price preferences. And, the, and I definitely encourage wallets to try to think of how you can cater to those different users. I just want, want to exercise caution of, um, building like super complicated UIs that users see first. Like as long as the first UI they see is the easy one, I think it can work out pretty well. And then for more advanced users, you know, they can use things like, we've seen a lot of these, you know, ETH gas station and um, I don't remember what the other one was, but I think by Block Native has one as well. They have all sorts of different pieces of information you can see. And then you can also look at like base fee over time. And so you can say, okay, I've noticed the base fee usually drops um, on Sunday at 4 p.m., the base fee is usually at its lowest. So I'm going to wait till Sunday at 4 p.m. and then see what the base fee is, and then try it then. But you know, if it's a uh, if there's a big token sale going on or an NFT sale going on at that time, then I'm going to wait until 5 p.m. Like this, things get really complex really fast. Um, so just a warning that if you go down this path of trying to build a UI for that, um, it gets really complicated incredibly quickly. Any comments on that? I did not mean to kill the conversation. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm sorry. It's hi, it's Don Vincenzo here. Uh, I'm a developer at Mistex uh, for the Alchemist community. Uh, we are utilizing a technology that's called Flashbots. Uh, for those who don't know about it, it's uh, directly sending to miners the transactions. And we are having a hard time building the UX uh, around the base fee due to the fact that the flashboards, the, when you send a transaction, the transaction will be sent and signed, sorry, will be signed by the user uh, immediately, including the, the max uh, gas fee. Um, but then this transaction is sent to flashboards uh, and retried until it's included. And this is what we do. Uh, this is the service that we propose. The issue that we are having is that to, uh, on, the UI, on the UI and as a UX, uh, we need to estimate the transaction fee uh, to show on the screen uh, to the user. And this estimation is to include the base fee. Due to the fact that we are submitting at every single block, uh, let's say that this transaction is not included in block one or block two or block plus three, but maybe block plus 20, uh, that means that we need to increase uh, on display, the on display potential estimated base fee that the user may be paying. So we, we basically need to show the max fee that they may be paying to remain honest about it and to remain transparent. But this is, this is a big problem that we have because this uh, on display only shows a really a potential uh, really high fee when the user is really not going to pay that max fee. This is going to be yeah. a very rare case where the increase is going to be uh, uh, at every block for the next 20 blocks, for example. I think, yeah, I, I think Melamask was, I, I saw a thread by Dan 
uh, from MetaMask yesterday kind of covering this. I think they tried to use like the average, you know, like how many blocks on average does it take for your transaction to be included? Uh, I, I, I don't know, Jake, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's yeah. I can't I, I can't speak to exactly what the estimated fee is, but it's it's taking our best guess and then highlighting the estimated number, and then we also show the max fee too as like an FYI. So it, it is. I mean, it's one of the things we struggled with the most in the UI is trying to to show that right because you don't want to show a super high fee that they're not actually going to pay most likely. But then you also don't want them to be surprised by a high fee if you never expose the max fee. So. Yeah, we do our best to guess, you know, or, or estimate what we think the user will pay and then highlight that number and then show the max fee as kind of a secondary number. Yeah, I guess what the issue that we are having is that um, we are uh, we are not, uh, I mean, whenever you use Uniswap, for example, you when you when you click on the swap button, you will be redirected to the MetaMask window, um, opening and showing clearly what gas uh, and fees you're going to pay. Um, so users clearly and naturally understand that this is extra fees and, and network fees. Since we are sending that to Flashbots, we can't have uh, that MetaMask window opening. Uh, and we are showing everything in one go in one place. And, and where we are being heard today is that users, they will compare our prices and our fees uh, with Uniswap, for example. And on Uniswap, they will not, that will not include any, any base fee or anything. That will be shown after in the next uh, display. So, so that's where we're being hurt at the moment. And this is really uh, something that we're trying to solve um, by uh, displaying better, explaining better, but also by finding the right way to, uh, to show a base fee that's not scary, that's not driving our users away. I see. So this, this is the problem of um, the person who is submitting the transaction is not the same person who is paying for the transaction. And currently, the transaction types that we support do not support um, secondary payers like they, we used to. So it used to be that you could have a different person paying for the transaction versus who signed the transaction, um, particularly with Flashbots, because you could you know, uh, submit a bundle where one person pays, one person doesn't. Um, we have talked about this before um, on having a new transaction type that would, uh, it's a couple options. One is we can make it so the miners can choose to cover the base fee. And this is something we talked about, and it almost got included, but we withdrew it because we wanted to keep the initial um, 1559 simpler. Um, I don't think there are any strong arguments against that one. So if people have real use cases, like it sounds like you do, um, for making it so miners can pay the base fee, then what that effectively means is that uh, from the Flashbots perspective, you would submit a bundle where the user's transaction had a base fee of zero, or sorry, had a max base fee of whatever, but that would be covered by the miner. I think that use case would work. Um, the other option is a new transaction type um, where you have um, two signatures, basically. One signature of the person who wants to do something on Ethereum and another signature for the person who's going to be paying for gas. And um, that also, you know, there's no strong arguments against it, like theoretically, it just needs a champion to kind of push it through the process and work out all the details. Um, both of these things are on the table. So I think your situation, we can do better in the future. Um, it's just this initial launch didn't have either of those. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that will help definitely um, both of those uh, proposals. Um, I, I don't think it will solve, uh, if, if you want the users to pay for the fees at the end of the day, I don't think that would be solved by those, but definitely that will give us room for, for, for extending uh, that kind of options. and start um, thinking of uh, another way to make profit and, and pay for the user's base fee and not carry them away like it does today. Anyone else have anything they wanted to share or bring up? If not, I guess one question I, I had for all the folks on here is, um, I understand that like 1559 was the first time in a long time we've had such a, a, a broadly impacting change to Ethereum that, that rippled across, uh, across a, a whole lot of different uh, areas. Um, 
we do have another one of those changes coming in the next, I don't know, six to nine months, depending on, on how things go uh, with the merge. Um, I'm curious if people here have anything, you know, that they, they would like to see or they think could help them as we're working on the merge uh, to make the transition smoother and to offer kind of a, you know, the, the best experience uh, to uh, their users. Um, yeah, like things, I, I don't know, either things that we didn't do in London that like you would have wished or things that you thought were actually quite good and, and, and that we should definitely do again. Um, yeah, that would be really useful as we're, as we're starting to work on this. Personally, I think these calls are great and trying to bring people from different levels of the stack helps a lot. In terms of what to improve, I would say try to Tagger more to give a little bit more time for each layer to implement uh, whatever they they have to implement. So the layers on top have enough time to adapt. For instance, yeah. having get ship um, fee history or all or required changes just a few weeks before the the merge made yeah. it really really difficult to to get to it. Yeah, and uh, focusing a lot on making sure that test nets are really representative of what's coming up on mainnet. For instance, something that beat us um, after the merge was that um, we have tested everything thoroughly on testnets, but the base fee on testnet was ridiculously low since blocks were not full usually. And so when we actually got a higher base fee on mainnet, some things uh, started failing due to poorly set up gas estimation. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's useful. Um, what like so you mentioned, you know, like having more time for like you know different layers of the stack to adapt and whatnot. What do you think is like, you know, the right amount of time from when you know we have kind of a, a release of JSON RPC to that that people can actually use you know the the features to like going live on mainnet? Um, yeah, is, is it like you know one month, two months, three months? Uh, hopefully not six months. <laughs> I, I would say it depends on the complexity of what yeah. we're looking at. For something like 1559, I would say, yeah, one, two months, probably two months sounds reasonable. Okay. Of course, I'm going to push for as much time as I ha as I can have as possible. Yeah. And that means putting more pressure on core devs and, uh, and client and no developers. So I know that the, this, uh, there is a tension between uh, like the, the time frames for, for each part of the stack. Yeah, but yeah, it, it's helpful to know the, the rough kind of estimate that, that yeah, of, of time that you need. Um, thanks, yeah, this, this is really, really valuable. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Micah, go ahead. Uh, what's your question? Uh, so I'm just curious, we, we have a particular group of people here, active, uh, like wallet developers and whatnot. I'm curious what you all think you need to do for the merge. Um, I, I suspect that like it differs greatly from what you actually need to do. And I think now sooner rather than later is a good time to uh, start clearing that up. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, like what do people think is necessary from wallet developers related to the merge? or non-wall developers, any third-party integrators. Uh, well, on the design side, I, ha I haven't even thought about it. So I don't know if that helps. I mean, you're more correct than a lot of people I've spoken to. <laughs> uh, in, in theory, the, the merge should have relatively little impact on integrations. Um, but I want to start those conversations now to make sure we're not forgetting something. Is, is everybody in the same boat, basically? Completely haven't thought about it. You just, you know, it's a thing that's sometime in the future. Yeah, this is um, Jen from Rainbow here. Yeah, I guess when I think about the merge, at least from a wallet perspective, that um, kind of relying on the, the tools underneath me to, to maybe have to shift a little bit, but we're kind of relying on not too much kind of changing from a UX perspective. So, uh, but yeah, 
also thinking of it as like, oh, sometime in the future. And once it gets more real, then um, we'll have these calls again with like the different, at the different layers of who needs to change what. That's a great point. Like what, maybe what's the point where it starts to feel real for you all, right? Like, uh, and, and I understand it's kind of farther in the future than when the clients start looking at it because, you know, right now it's not even implemented in, in, in places like Geth and, and whatnot. But yeah, what, what are like the, I don't know, the signs that'll make it feel real for you? Um, is that, that's helpful? Uh, hey, this is Sorry. Bruno from Rainbow. Uh, yeah, uh, I just want to say that uh, I think it's like a, a gradual kind of like, a, um, you know, implementation and like, you know, first client level, then having yep. a testnet, then wallets yep. can start playing with it and then dApps and, yep. and other people, right? Like in that yep. order. Yeah. Uh, without without having testnets, starting yep. to think about stuff, like not starting to think, but like actually doing any work, it's, yep. you know, it's just like theory, right? Yeah. When you say testnet, so one, one challenge that we've had in the past is like, it's easy to spin up new testnets, um, you know, like, like a merge testnet, for example. Um, but because a lot of people actually rely on Gordy, Robston, and Rinkeby, it's, it's a bit harder to like fork them until we're pretty, uh, you know, pretty far in the process. Um, how useful is it for like you all when we have test net, like new test nets, is it something that's like easy for you to integrate and like, you know, you can kind of start prototyping or is it something that's basically useless because if it's not Gordy, Rinkeby or, 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 uh, or Robston, um, then you just can't really do much because of how your infrastructure is set up. Uh, for us, it's not, it doesn't make a difference, I think. Okay. Um, like, you know, it depends, like, aside from, like, being a test or a new test or not, it, like, it depends on, like, how many raking changes in, like, code or, like, JSON or PC yeah, yeah. or no, that stuff. That, that's what yeah. actually breaks or, like, complicates things and not okay. the, the, uh, the test net itself, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's helpful. Um, Um, that's pretty much all I had. Anything else anybody wanted to bring up? Um, this is uh, Michigan from Anchorage Digital. I um, I know I kind of missed the boat on this, but I, I just wanted to voice uh, support on, um, I think it was Don from uh, Flashbots that was mentioning, uh, per, you know, the difficulty of predicting the fees uh, that we're displaying for our customers and perhaps including the new kind of uh, transaction types or whatever the ideas are that we are, we're kind of coming up with for kind of solving the issue of, you know, a, a long time for uh, where base fee may uh, be changing drastically between when transaction is initiated to submitted. So um, just wanted to kind of reiterate support for that. Got it. Um, I had just a few, I mean, I haven't, I have to think about it a little bit more, but um, uh, Barnaby, thank you. Thank you for your, for your notes and presentation. Um, and I think I'd like to digest kind of what your findings were and especially the kind of the, the last slide that you had with the, you know, uh, this 2X is equal to, you know, or it covers like hundred percent of the time or 99 point whatever percent of the time. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe it'll be easier if we follow up afterwards uh, with some people just to see if we could break do down even further. Because um, I know that your your numbers were for all all time. Um, or, and so I would like to kind of distinguish between certain peaks and, and, and norms and uh, like when things are flat versus when things are spiking. Um, and then Micah, you were talking about, it's funny because like from a wallet perspective, um, yeah, we, we were kind of trapped because we were trying to take into consideration um, the user's intent, which is distinguishing between when a user wants now or never versus whenever versus like, I really want to get this in. It's got to be ASAP and I want to keep trying until it gets in, you know, like, like that, 
that uh, urgent but also extended timeline versus uh, just now or never. And of course, now or never is much easier. Um, we do have plans in our UI to kind of be like, hey, things are going crazy right now. Uh, it might be better just to try again later, sort of sort of thing when things are spiking. Um, but we would we were kind of hoping that um, I don't know if Etherscan or, or some other APIs are here, but uh, we were kind of hoping that this could be more of like a math problem that is solved by someone who could just give us the numbers that we want for these different scenarios versus, you know, like so that the user doesn't have to do the math, but the API can do the math and we can just give them an appropriate suggestion based off of the intent that we read off of the user. Um, I, I assume that's probably very uh, hopeful. So <laughs> it's so it is possible to do the math. Like, like I mentioned, it's, it's really like a three dimensional curve. And right. if you know the inputs for that curve, you can do the math and tell the user, okay, this is what you should do. Um, the, the hard part is getting those inputs from the user um, in a like digital form. So, so a user who just kind of vaguely says, you know, I kind of am in a, in a hurry. That's not super helpful for, for the math side, like turning, I'm kind of in a hurry into like, this is the digitization of my time preference. Um, that's the real, real hard part. So if you guys can figure out, or someone can figure out how to distill a user's time preference and price preference relative to each other into like quantifiable numbers, then we can definitely, you know, put together a formula that will tell them, okay, this is what you should do based on, you know, all of history and, you know, what we know about the ecosystem, all these things. Um, I'm not sure if that's reasonable or realistic at all, because I think like, even when I ask myself, like, what is my time preference? I can't put that into a number. Like, I don't know what my time preference number is. I just know that, you know, I kind of want it to go in today, maybe, <laughs> or like, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go to bed soon and I want to be sure it's in before I fall asleep. So in the next couple of hours, like they're very vague numbers for me. Um, I don't know if other right. people have more solid things. Uh, um, do you think it would be, so, so I can understand like trying to extrapolate user's intent into actual inputs to a mathematical function. I understand that, but I, I'm wondering if we can uh, kind of chop it up into like maybe three or four different categories or boxes um, in some way. I mean, yeah, I'd have to think about it a bit more, but that would be, if that math function is there, and then maybe we can give a little bit more thought of like, how do we translate uh, user intent or how do we even um, uh, get a signal about user intent? I think we have a few ideas about how to get the signal for user's intent. Um, then yeah, maybe we can follow up on that. You, after. you might be able to kind of craft some like straw man users where you just kind of describe a particular person and then you give that yeah. like fake person some actual numbers to plug into these formulas. And then yeah. you say, you know, are you this person or are you this person or are you this person? Um, that yeah. might be possible. Um, it, it's still yeah. gonna be vague, like those, those people won't map exactly to actual real humans, but that might get us closer. So instead of just mapping to the now or never person as our only straw man, we now have, you know, yeah. three or four straw men and you can map to user yeah. can then pick one from like a nice little picture book. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think that would be helpful just, and I guess from, a, from our perspective, we would, um, I, I'm glad that Barnaby had that, that slide about how 2X seems generally on average too high because intuitively we also think that we should tighten the, the, the multiple that's placed on the base fee. And if anything, kind of like, play around with a priority fee instead because um, yeah, because we are kind of like, uh, like e even if, if you're urgent, then you kind of, if you're urgent now or never, you also want like a, a tighter uh, multiple because you don't want to be potentially waiting, you know, waiting around forever. Uh, but if you don't care that much, then it's kind of unfair to show you a huge range of prices that you could, you could, uh, you, you could use. So it's better just to like, wait around and and maybe you might get dropped if it's really busy but it's it's better to give you like a tightened bound like we we don't want to have a huge range that we show to a user where on average it's like you know a, a very small subset of that range that you're actually going to be spending um that's what we'd like to avoid um so yeah i guess I, i'm just asking for like magical uh uh, estimations that <laughs> that'll work. I, I nominate Barnaby. 
to, to do magic. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I don't know if we have enough time, but on that, um, on, in, in Barnaby's slides, you heard, there was one example of kind of a normal scenario where there was some variability in the base fee. But if, I think if, the, if you were to create a moving average, you would see oscillations in, in the base fee across that. Um, and then there was the other scenario with uh, um, with multiple consecutive full blocks. Um, and the, the issue on the design side is, right, okay, which of these two scenarios are we currently in? So how do we reasonably estimate um, whether somebody will be included in the next few blocks based on which curve the, 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 the everything is currently on? Um, and <laughs> it's almost impossible to tell. Like you don't know what is going to happen. You don't know if the trend is going to continue upwards, and it will take a long time for that period of time to pass with the multiple consecutive full blocks, or whether it's just kind of the normal state where things oscillate up and down. Um, and with that, on the design side, it's really, really difficult to make a call and say, okay, actually we're in this situation, and it's going to take. X amount of time for you to be included, um, and it's also quite difficult to flag. Okay, we're on a we're on an upward trend here, and we don't know when this is going to end. It doesn't instill confidence, and it's quite difficult to communicate. Um, and <laughs> if somebody figures out how to communicate these potential scenarios, then great, perfect. Um, but I'm not sure whether it's whether just having um, uh, like a way to determine which of these two trends you're on is going to be helpful to lots of people. It may be helpful to some, definitely, but um, I think, yeah, there's lots of communications that need to be done here above um, actually determining those, those trends. So... The, the core problem here is anyone who can answer the question of which trend are we on can make far more money by going into finance than we can offer to pay them to <laughs> help us. <laughs> yeah. uh, because essentially it's the exact same problem as predicting the like, future price of a stock or you know, a commodity. It's, 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 it's an attempt to predict future demand for an asset, which comes down to like you know keeping an eye on all the things that are happening in Ethereum, keeping an eye on the news, sentiment analysis, like when we get these bursts, they're not bursts because of something that's predictable. They're always bursts of like something that happened, like an event occurred in the world that resulted in all of a sudden everybody wants to use Ethereum. Now, that being said, some of these events, air quotes around that, are seasonal. And so um, there really is, you know, at a certain time of day, every day, the fees generally are lower than other times of day. We do see strong seasonality in gas prices. And so those ones we can predict and we can show to users potentially. Um, and they're actually pretty easy to, to graph. Like you just look at the, especially now we have the base fee that become really easy to graph. So you just look at the base fee over time and then you know plot by day, plot by time of day, plot by day and time. And we should see some very strong seasonality. But um, the ones like we saw earlier, which was like an NFT sale or something, those ones are just effectively random for anyone who's not you know an NFT buyer. <laughs> And you know, it's NFTs today. It was ICOs before that. It was CryptoKitties before that. It was, you know, some 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 event occurs in the world. Elon Musk tweets something and it triggers it. And so I, I just want to make sure everybody's aware that it is very unlikely we'll ever fully solve that problem. The best we can do is capture the seasonal stuff and try to express uh, present that and let people know, hey, we're on the you know morning uptrend, like every morning it starts to go up. So we're going to estimate a little higher or we're on the evening downtrend. So we're going to estimate a little lower, like we can maybe do that. Um, but I think that's probably about the best we're going to get realistically. Um, one thing I've noticed is that it was uh, especially difficult. Uh, I mean, it was really like, EIP 1559 went live and we discovered the effects or some of the effects were discovered after the, the go live. Uh, is there already, and I'm not, I will not be aware of that yet, uh, or is it possible to have a test net which will have all the transactions replayed uh, maybe with a delay of 24 hours or something? 
that will allow us to see the impact uh, of such upgrades? The two so challenges. Good. Yeah, the two challenges with that is one, um, basically the, the tech to replay transactions is 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 hard. Uh, that's you know solvable, but uh, yeah, we don't have a team or, or that that can uh, that can help with that. The second part is uh, the money, basically. So like because transactions on mainnet are worth something, um, we get like a different patterns and different incentives to send than like on test nets. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to get like a, yeah, a perfect replay basically. Um, and to expand on that a little bit, um, the, one of the issues with re replay test nets is that they very quickly fall out of sync um, because if you're replaying under a different rule set, some transactions will fail that previous that on the main net succeeded. And so, um, I guess it, I guess in this case, you're sorry. When we talked about this before, we were talking about test nets for future changes. Are you talking about test nets for future changes, or do you want just a a test net that just replays history, so you can do testing like back testing, basically? What I'm thinking is, uh, for example, for this go live, uh, if uh, a week before EIP 5059 was was uh, deployed on a on a test net that every day uh, was uh, getting uh, the main net transactions with a delay. Um, we will have seen some of those issues that we're having now uh, a bit earlier uh, with our new UI, new UX, and, 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 and the impact it has. I understand it's difficult, right? I understand it's, it's not something easy to do. Uh, but I was thinking you don't really need to uh, reproduce uh, some of those uh, data, like you don't need to reproduce this, the from uh, the addresses or anything. I think the, what matters here is, is the, the amounts, uh, the tokens in play, um, and, and the, 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 that all the transactions, the, the, I mean, we got the same flow of transactions, the same number of transactions in the system, so we can really see the impact uh, that those will have uh, on the gas and, and the usage of the network eventually. Yeah, so the core devs have talked about this in the past, and I, th I think we generally got agreement this would be generally useful for the core devs as well. Um, just because it's nice, like you said, it's nice to see real world stuff. The issue that we run into is that when the rules are different between the two chains, they very quickly fall out of sync with each other. And so transactions, mm -hmm. like you start with one transaction that fails on the test net, but doesn't fail on mainnet. And then that leads to the world state being slightly different. And then now another transaction fails because the world state is different and then another one. And this kind of balloons out pretty rapidly. We don't know how rapidly that happens. It probably depends on specifics of the rule changes. Um, but so it means we can't just like spin one up and leave it up forever because eventually the world state will differ so much that we just simply doesn't make any sense to replay anymore because everything's failing. Um, that being said, we can we talk about doing things like you know having a, a daily or weekly reset or something. So it's just so we constantly do have real 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 world transactions being replayed on a test network um, using new rule set, but we just reset it periodically to make sure the world states say stay in sync, and that is an option. The like I said, the the core devs generally were favorable to this idea. Um, it's just a matter of core devs are overworked <laughs> and we have to choose. And at least for London we decided not to do this. But we did talk about, you know, maybe for the next um, next big feature fork or something, we will want to do this. Um, like, like I said, there, there's general interest. It's just a matter of prioritization. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and yeah, Liggy, I, you had your hand up a while back and we never got to you, so. Oh yeah, that was to the other thing. Uh, basically, it's not. I wanted to say it's not only personas. Basically, where you uh, need to make preferences, it's also the transaction type. Um, for example, I'm a persona that uh, usually doesn't care about the timing, but then when it comes to Uniswap transactions that has a timeout, um, then it's a problem. Uh, then you want it fast. And yeah. uh, I once made um, a post on magicians about that. Um, that we should make uh, a way to signal that. So either via um, nut spec, so that contract authors um, specify that on nut spec, or we add it to the RPC so that we as wallets, that's also good for the user experience because then we have less cognitive load on the user, right? So if, if they don't need to decide, it's better. Um, but it's also an important signal um, because then also it's happening for a lot of users. They don't really know about the timeout. 
um, or the expiry of the transaction. And uh, so basically the, tra the, the transactions uh, can also signal that they want in very fast. It's not only fast enough. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would love to see that. Good read. Any, we're already a bit over time, but um, we're still here. So any final questions or comments? Um, if I wanted to follow up with Barnabé or, or Micah, should I just do that on the, um, the Discord? Yeah, so we have a 1559 dev channel, which yeah. probably makes yeah, sense to the... use. Yeah. Cool. And then relatedly, does it make sense to have another one of these calls? Probably not like two weeks, but like, I don't know, does it help people in like a month or like when people have had more time to, to like dig into this? Um, yeah, we don't, we don't have to schedule it now, but yeah, do people generally want another one of these calls about 1559? And if so, when would be like the right timing? There's at least one yes. Um, yeah, I would, I I would like at least yeah one more one more call after you do a little bit more uh, back and forth first. So probably yeah. a month makes sense. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So let's yeah let's aim for a a, a month from now roughly. All all. Um, yeah, it's probably easiest to have it be literally four weeks from now when it's like not all core devs or something. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll make sure to uh, to set that up. Um, to your last answer, Tim, aren't we combining the 1559 channels into just bound uh, the market? Yeah, so there might be like, end? yeah, so th there might, we might rename the channels on Discord to have it be just fee market. So if you can't find a channel with 1559, fee market is basically the same thing. It might make sense. I guess just given this and that we're having another call in a month, I'm, I'm fine with just holding to, to change that. Um, yeah, I don't think it has to happen right now. But yeah, if there is no more 15 gigs nine channel, just search for fee market. And if you're not sure, just ask anywhere in the Discord and somebody will will um, will share the link. Uh, yeah, let me just share the link to the Discord in the chat here. There you go. Cool. Anything I else? Muting the I recommend oh. anyone who joins that mute the channels you're not interested in. There's a lot yes. of them. Yes, this is all of the core devs channels across all of the research. So yeah, uh, definitely we're muting uh, aggressively. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks a lot everybody for coming on. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share the information for the next call um, when, it's, when it's all set up. I'll see you. Thank you. Thanks, see you.